All right, my friends, happy Sunday to you. We dragged James Larson here again. He cranked out another review for Audio Hawks, the Arendelle 1723S Tower or Tower S, Tower S, I should say. Right? Tower S 1723S Tower. It's the S version of their big tower. So what the S means is that it has the six and a half inch drivers instead of the eight inch drivers. Now, a while back, you reviewed the 1723 monitor. Yes. And that was the bookshelf, largest bookshelf probably we've yeah. ever reviewed. <laughs> well, there is so, also the uh, that JBL, what is it, L100, the new version. That was actually oh, yeah, probably that was, bigger. That was pretty big too, That's yeah. Bookshelf speaker, <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. I, I would just call that, for the 1723 monitors, I would just call them stand mount speakers. They're just too, I mean, they're technically bookshelf speakers. You could put them in a bookshelf, I guess, but like yeah. they're just huge stand mount speakers. Well, so Arendelle has two different versions of, of their speakers in the um, 1723 series. They have the regular version with the 8-inch drivers, and then they have the S version with the 6.5-inch drivers. And I really wanted you to look at the 6.5-inch version of this speaker because we already know that their monitor is awesome, so it's safe to assume that the tower version of it would be awesome too. just adds a couple more woofers for bass. But I wanted to see what would happen when we step down to the six and a half inch drivers, because let's face it, most people don't have a lot of floor space. They can't put a really large speaker. They probably could put a, a floor standing speaker that's more reasonably sized. And the 1723S version of the tower is more the size range of like a Polk R700 or the, uh, the uh, what was the, the Aurora 1000s. Um, yeah, actually, the, the Arendelle speakers are a bit smaller than those. Oh, okay. So it's, but it's a very manageable box size. So we wanted to see how these performed. We have the written review on our homepage right now at audioholics.com. I suggest you guys read that. I'll link it in the description below. James did exhaustive measurements on that speaker. He also did some really detailed subject subjective listening tests. But it's always good to kind of go over this stuff with the guy that did the review and ask questions. And of course, we're here uh, if people ask some questions related to the product. And I think even Brandon's here from Arendelle Sound. How's it going, Brandon? Good to see you, bud. So you got a little slideshow presentation here. I'm going to put it up here. And again, guys, this is the Arendelle 1723 Tower S THX review. So these are THX certified speakers yes these are thx uh ultra certified there's different levels ultra, of yeah thx certification ultra is like next to the the biggest the dominus but it's it's like there's compact select ultra and dominus and uh, the ultra is pretty it's a pretty sub significant uh certification you know for like a high-powered home theater you, you really need a good high-powered product to get to attain ultra certification yeah, both in output and in just, you know, the frequency response requirements and compression and all that stuff. So, yeah. All right. So here we are. It's a four or five drivers, three six and a half inch base drive or two six and a half inch dedicated base drivers, two six and a half inch for the mid and base. And then that tweeter with the uh, waveguide. Yeah, it's a two and a half way speaker using the all the six and a halves are the same driver, but the... um lower six and a half the lower two six and a halfs are crossed over to 100 hertz and so they just deal with deep bass and the upper two bass drivers that flank the tweeter they um go from was 15 hertz 1500 hertz and, and below and all the way down to deep bass too so they, they share the same deep bass range as the lower two drivers but they're also taking care of the mids up to the tweeters crossover point Gotcha. So you're really getting essentially four drivers playing bass. So this speaker should have plenty of bass. And we'll talk more about that in your measurements and your subjective listening impressions. But let's take a closer look here at the specs. Sure. Okay. Well, there is different operating. You can seal. There's two ports in the back. You can seal one or both of them. I don't recommend you seal them, <laughs> except yeah. in very particular circumstances. Like I said, driver 1.1, a dome tweeter, uh, loaded in a spherical waveguide and four six and a half long pulp fiber cones. Um, the, the, the speaker is made of high density fiberboard, which is really heavy. This is not a, a very, it's not a huge tower speaker. 
it's like a medium sized one, but it weighs a lot. It's just, it's, it's heavy. It's a heavy speaker, 60, 60 pounds. I mean, 70 pounds for something that's like a medium sized power speaker is most. Yeah. yeah I, I, I have two, two tower speakers. I mean, they were heavier than the Heco speakers that are re reviewed. They're heavier than these big air, uh, Focal speakers that I have in house, but they're smaller speakers. So this, the, they're built like a tank. Yeah. Know? And yeah. you can get them in a satin, both satin white, satin black, and gloss white and gloss black. If it were me, I would like the satin white. Just if it's a nice satin white, that would be my preferred, like you know, finish. Right? I think that's really slick. Yeah, um, and if you're doing a theater room, you probably don't want to do anything with gloss because you're going to get a lot of reflections, especially if you're doing a projector or something. So, stick with the uh, satin black would be the can, not the yeah, gloss. Set, yeah, yeah but very much satin black for is for like a dedicated home theater room with a projector for sure now um, it's interesting that the it's the one vent tune shows the bass response is less extended than two vents but i mean usually when you block one vent you should get a little bit lower frequency extension just less output right yeah but if you do block a vent you'd lose um sensitivity yeah you lose sensitivity and so it, it lowers extension but also lowers output and so um so it might not meet a, like a plus or minus three dB window anymore if you, right, you right. do that. So, yeah. So, so two things that stand out here, uh, they're four ohm speakers, four ohm nominal, and we'll, we'll talk about that with the impedance profile, but you'd want to use a, a decently stout receiver amp or dedicated amp, preferably for a speaker like this. And the cool thing here is free shipping and a 60 day trial period. So if you don't like the speaker after, 60 days you know right before 60 days they'll pay for the shipping back i mean that's that's a new policy yeah that they just instantiated that um so like there's not a risk um to um give them a try really if you you know if you have uh, room for them or if you if you're shopping for speakers in this price point sure it's like there's no risk except you all, all you have to do is lose your all you have to lose is your time Oh, looks like we lost Gene. <laughs> That's not good. Gene, come back to us. Um, I guess I can just keep going. Um, well, hopefully Gene is on his way back. Yeah, so there's some weird bug on this computer and I just lose sound sporadically. I don't know why it's doing it, but let me get back into the slide presentation. Sure, that's I've okay. I've not figured out the gremlin in my computer. Okay, so, so yeah, a couple of slides in. Oh yeah, oh, here's one thing, it's, go, go back. Oh. Yeah. We're forward to slide, yeah. yeah. So one thing I was really impressed by because you can only get these speakers, you know, by by uh, shipping them to your house. They really have to have good packing, right? And these have really, really good packing. Okay, so look look at the inside and the outside of the speakers. They have um they have uh, edge protectors and corner protectors on both Damn. the outside and inside of the speakers, right? And and almost every single surface is is covered by um a poly um poly uh I think it's urethane that open cell foam right that a stiff yeah. open cell foam so there's no exposed surfaces for something like to bump into the speaker and, and and get through the cardboard to the speaker you know and it has like a like a kind of a rayon kind of like like sack that it's it's stuffed in this really nice like uh, covering on it and and also they they give you these white cotton gloves. So you can handle the speakers without putting like you know your fingerprints on them because you know fingerprints show up pretty well on a on a gloss or well basically gloss surface. So like the packing here is is a uh, among the best I've ever seen. Much better than even speakers that cost a lot more than these. So that's, yeah, I mean they just want to minimize any kind of shipping damage, especially if they ship everywhere. I mean God, uh, last time I talked to Arundel, they had everything in stock. So I know there's a lot of supply chain issues with product these days, but their entire product line seems like there's inventory on it now. So, yeah. And, and like, but, but the speaker is so heavy. It really does need this, this level of shipping and, and they give it to you. So like this, this is like, it, it had probably pretty costly to go this far with their shipping, but they don't want to, you know, they want to, it shows, I guess, pride in the, in the product that they want to protect it so much, you know? No so doubt. Like, yeah. <clears throat> so here's, here's images of the speakers with and without grills. I think the grills, they're fine, you know, they kind of, I'm not crazy about grill, the way speakers look with grills because they blank out their drivers, but at least these grills have some curvature to them, right? Yeah, they look kind of nice. It looks kind of integrated into the baffle. And, and, and they're, 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 the grills are kind of like a like a hexagon kind of mesh pattern. Like, a, and, and they really, they're, they're held on by some uh, 
magnets and they have a really strong hold and they really protect the drivers. It's not just like some fabric draped over a like thin wooden frame, right? Nothing. I mean, you can, if something like, if someone's throwing a ball around the room and it, and it hits the grill, right? It's the grill is going to protect those drivers. So they're very right. well protected. These are functional grills for sure. It's like, I mean, it looks good with, with or without the grills. Personally, I like it without, especially because there's no, um, there's no threaded insert holes, right? Because of the magnets. So it's yeah, just no a grill smooth, guides. Yeah. So it's just a smooth baffle, basically. Yeah, it's, it's really it's, it, it looks cool. It's a little bit more aggressive looking without the grills, but I like that. It doesn't bother me. So, you know, it's just it's a matter of personal taste, though. There you go. Uh, okay, here's here's a picture of the tweeter. Um I uh, took this one out. I don't take these out. If you have one of these speakers, don't take it out. I was given special permission and special instructions by Arundel on how to do this right. It's not easy. One thing to notice, okay, so this is a spherical waveguide, a, a dome tweeter mounted in a spherical waveguide. Okay, so look at that top um, right picture, Gene. Okay, you see there's a yep. bucking magnet, right, on the top of that, the motor, yep. right? Yep, And below that is the bottom plate, right, that black ring underneath the bucking magnet. Gotcha. And, and, and underneath that, there's a silver ring, right? That's actually a really big neodymium magnet, a really big and powerful one. In, in fact, taking the tweeter out, I had a really hard time getting it back in and out because the 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 neodymium magnet was so powerful it kept on grabbing the screwdriver and pulling it away from me. Right, that is a really powerful tweeter motor. And, and something else to note is, um, like most most horn loaded or waveguide loaded speakers just have the waveguide, but to like damp any kind of ringing or any kind of weird you know resonant modes of the waveguide material itself, they have the CNC cut wooden block. Right on the tweeter, on the on the waveguide. So there, it's just, it's really well. This is a really really well built tweeter. It's it's crazy overbuilt. It's crazy to find a, a tweeter like. I mean, it's not a cheap speaker, but yeah, this is like a, a nice tweeter. You, you you'd almost expect to see in a much more expensive speaker. They, yeah, it's a really well and overbuilt. Um, and speaker. that looks like wood that's around the the frame of that. Driver. Yeah, it's, it's it's a it's a CNC cut wooden block, right? That's, wow. that's that the, the waveguide is totally sunken. So the the waveguide has like you know contact on on all all of its uh, interior surface with this wooden block. Yeah. And so like it's heavy, heavy duty. It's some serious business there. I mean, it doesn't look like an OEM part. It looks like this was custom made for Arundel. Nothing, right? nothing. Arundel has is um, yeah, it's all made for Arundel. This is not something you buy off the shelves, you know. So yeah, gotcha. you can't get this at like. Like you know, parts for us or something like that. Yeah, really. And uh, be, before we go back to that, the there's a, the advantages of having this waveguide is you you better match the handoff between the tweeter and the mids, so you yes, get it, less fr frequency response anomalies and better integration of the drivers. And you also increase the sensitivity of the speaker. You get a little bit more low end output out of the tweeter with something like this. So you could cross the tweeter over a little bit uh, lower. And and just get better phase integration with between the mids and the tweeters. You also get it controls directivity better th through more of its wave, uh, more of its like frequency band. So like if this speaker didn't have a waveguide, what you'd see is like it would have a very wide dispersion at the lower part of its band. But when you go up, it, it really narrows. What a waveguide can do is it, it keeps the whole thing narrow, or, or, or like like a medium level of dispersion, whatever the designer decides. Through, through not just the lower part, but also the upper part. So this actually widens dispersion at the, the top end and lowers mm -hmm. dispersion at the bottom to keep the whole thing consistent. But we'll see that in the, in the measurements. Yeah, see how that I got gotcha. you. Um, here's the uh, the woofer, the giant motor on the woofer. This is a six and a half. And that's just that's like a hell of a big motor. The, the, that must be with a bucking magnet too, right? I don't think there's a bucking magnet on this. No, that's, oh, that's the, the, t the bottom is a top plate and that thing around it is like around the motor is just this like thin kind of rubber shroud, you know? And so it's just one big giant motor, like just a giant, right? For a six and a half, right? That's impressive. Yeah, like six really. Six and a half, that's gigantic, right? And you can see it's, it's mounted on a, a cast iron um, frame with a, a pretty, you know, nice big, uh, spider if you see inside the the um frame there that's a big spider so it should permit some heavy duty excursion you know i don't think you know these are not like subwoofer for drivers but they have pretty good excursion and yeah definitely the motor and, and spider allows handling. for it yeah it's, this is a heavy duty motor again uh, almost more than what you'd expect to see in a, a speed that's three thousand dollars a pair 
and in a driver that small. So that's this is definitely this thing is potent. It's yeah, meant to play loud. Right. Yeah, for sure. Okay, here's some images of the back of the speaker. You can see the, the dual ports there. They have some pretty uh, some na substantial ports. And he, the binding post plate is crazy overbuilt. When, I mean, it's just this big, like, brushed aluminum piece. And the binding posts are some five-way um, rhodium-plated polished binding posts. You know, you, you can buy out these speakers if you want. Note, note how the binding post plate is sunk in the back, the back yeah. of the BM. So think about how thick... The, the just the rear baffle of this driver is it is really thick right this is built like a tank this speaker right it feels like it too so like um it's you know you can buy amp these speakers or buy wire them if you want um they, they have they, you could you could give them a lot more power than a normal avr could so it almost justifies having dual you know i'm not normally a fan of that right but if you had these can take like 400 watts mm -hmm. so like they they if you wanted more output than what a um regular avr could give then yeah you could there, there's a argument for biamping these if you wanted the extra output for yeah because sure. then you could adjust the gain and you could you know turn the bass up a little bit more that way as well i mean yeah you could if you wanted um yeah they have the, the capability for sure with 400 watt power handling yeah so nice uh, flared flared por ports on the bottom yeah they're they're flared on in the inside and outside so yeah they're big there's a lot going on with the speaker, obviously. So you yeah, that back plate looks killer, man. Those are not cheap connectors. This is very high quality there. Yeah, again, again, you'd almost expect to see this on a more expensive speaker than what these cost. Now the seventeen twenty three monitor did that have the same similar kind of back, uh, yes, the same connectors and everything. Yeah, yeah, it was basically the same as this. Yeah. Cool. Here's the crossover. I'm sure. I'm sure a crossover guy will look at this and say, you know what? I could change some of those parts. <laughs> yeah no you couldn't no this is a really good crossover you know the, a bunch of like um air air core inductors there's, there's an iron big old iron core inductor some really beefy capacitors i mean this is a big this is the back of that plate okay look how big that thing is right that was a big yeah. plate right yeah I mean, that's look how big those resistors are look how big those capacitors are and that was that was a bit that's a big back plate right or, or, or a binding post plate so this is this is huge heavy high power handling 250 oh. volt parts too that's a good sign right there yeah this is a heavy duty Five percent tolerance on those caps yeah i mean that's good stuff yeah this, this is like yeah that's again you're really getting your money's worth i mean mm -hmm. not the cheap speaker not terribly expensive but wow you are getting your money's worth so rhodium plating on the binding post not magnetic parts cool very cool yeah um so i guess you could go to the next slide okay all right so you why do you bring all your speakers outside for james what's that all about man um so okay you can't measure these kind of speakers indoor that well you can you can sort of do it and measure the tweeter tweeter range frequencies indoors but not not woofer range frequencies because the um the acoustic reflections of the the speaker will contaminate the microphone and, and cause all kinds of problems so you have to measure speakers like this in an anechoic chamber or in a, an outdoor area where it's elevated far enough off the ground that the acoustic reflection from the ground, you know, will um, get you a, a good amount of bandwidth um, on, on the top. And it'll, it'll still get in the speaker. I mean, mm -hmm. in the measurements on the on the in the base, but I can window that out. And so I, I'm getting very good um, high resolution measurements all the way down to like 300 hertz with, the, with um, doing this technique. So um, yeah, you can't really do these measurements. You need an anechoic chamber an outdoor what i call free air measurement or you have to have some like that fancy clipple rig with you know it's crazy you know that yeah. robot arm. yeah the robot arm thing that, that that's that takes some very heavy d math and manipulation and it has to take thousands of measurements to to do you know what what we do so here. did you carry this thing up to that to that uh platform yourself or did you get some help i had a little help i had a little help i, I couldn't okay, do this I'll by myself so, yeah because like this would break my back yeah, I mean, sometimes I do have to carry these up there by myself, but and this one, the seventy pounds is. It's not just that I can I could do it if it was just seventy pounds. It it's wouldn't be a big deal. Too, yeah. It's, but it's also I'm not, I'm trying not to put any scuffs or scratches on a really nice you know polished black, uh, polished, uh, gloss black exterior, right? I'm trying to yep. keep these in pristine condition, so that's really why I need help with this. I, I could just throw it up there with just seventy pounds of that you know 
dead weight. So yeah. Yeah, but I gotcha. All right. So you did the measurements and let's uh, take a look at what you got here. So this is the depiction of the frequency response, both on axis and off axis. You can see what the uh, off axis um, responses is doing with respect to the on axis re response. And it's key, having a very good course corresponding response you know there's no weird crazy off axis deviation you know from the except maybe above like 15 kilohertz where it really doesn't matter you know like super high trouble yeah but for for like the audible bandwidth there's really good correspondence from from the on on axis and off axis um responses everything should sound the same wherever you are on the speaker's axis so um there's just a lot of good news here and if you the good news about that is any kind of EQ and you're doing will actually be more effective for a speaker that measures like this as opposed to having a drastically different off axis response than it's on axis, right? Yeah, you cannot predictably EQ a speaker where the on axis response is not like the off axis response because a lot of what you hear is acoustic reflections from the room, right? And so if you just if you EQ the on axis response, then it, it who knows what that's going to do to the off axis response and how that behaves with the room, but if everything is the same, then all the acoustic reflections or, or the off-axis reflections will match the on-axis, you know, an equalization you do on-axis, and so it, you can predictably equalize it. And and, and, yep. and this gives you a better picture of, of how flat the response is. This is like a profile view of what we just saw. This gives you a better um, idea of like how flat it is, how neutral it is. We see a little bit of rise in the bass and, and the treble, but for the most part, it's really it's it's pretty linear. It's pretty and neutral. you know what? I I kind of like speakers that do that anyway, just because I like my treble just a tad hot. As I get as you get older, you tend you tend to find speakers that are really flat in that area to be a little dull, and you might have to boost the treble a little bit anyway. But if you for some reason you think that it's the treble's too high, like we said before, you could put a shelving filter on this and flatten that up. No penalties yeah, but, at all. Yeah, you could really just put a shelving filter maybe around starting at like six kilohertz, seven kilohertz, and, yeah. and you could tame that trouble a little bit. But I think most people, it's not like obnoxiously hot. This it's a tad hot, right? The trouble a tad hot, but it, it doesn't happen at a low enough frequency where I think it makes speakers sound hot, right? Maybe a little bit. It's hard to even call these bright. I mean, it, but you, you can hear it, but it's not it's not like obnoxious or anything. There's there's speakers much much brighter than these. So, I gotcha. Yeah. Here's a here's a, a kind of a top down view of the grass we just saw, which gives you an idea of this dispersion and how how well it's controlled. Now you can see here at the, the tweeter's um crossover point, that's like fifteen kilohertz. No, not fifty, one point five kilohertz or fifteen hundred hertz, right? The the waveguide kind of restricts dispersion to like I I'm gonna say like a, about a 40, 40 degree angle all the way way past like 10 kilohertz and so you get a nice even control of the dispersion if you didn't have that the waveguide you would have a lot more um uh you wouldn't have as uh how should i say like flat or even or even as dispersion as this it would be lots of dispersion at the down to about five kilohertz i mean up to five kilohertz and then uh, above five kilohertz would really start beaming but the, the waveguide really um keeps the control over it all the way you know way past 10 kilohertz so there's a lot of benefits to that waveguide. Yeah. And so Sweet. you can go to the, uh, here, here are some ground plane measurements. This is, I can't do these measurements in the free air response because the the reflection from the ground would get in the microphone. So you have to do this in ground plane. Uh, you have to put the microphone and the speaker on the ground. And so the microphone especially has to be on the ground so that there is no ground bounce that contaminates the microphone. If the microphone is yeah. on the ground, it is the ground. And so this is how you that's how you measure a bass response so this is a measurement of the low frequency responses of the speaker of the 1723s for all of its operating modes and you see it, it barely gets a little bit more extension between 20 and 25 hertz with one port seal but you lose sensitivity so like you said i would not i would just leave both ports open yeah so yeah, leave both what what this doesn't show is how much headroom so you lose like like half the headroom for when you seal a port right because yeah. now one of those ports isn't generating any sound whatsoever so you lose a lot of, so this shows the, the response but if if you if you really cranked it you'd actually lose more um output by stealing a, a port than you would um what's shown here because like you just you have the output there right and I guess, and 
but, the only but, time the only time I would recommend sealing these speakers is if you're running sealed subwoofers, right? Because the phase the phase alignment issue between a ported speaker and a sealed sub can cause cancellations at the tuning. So well, and the sub the sub doesn't matter if it's sealed or not. I mean that because the, the the phase rotation of a sealed of a subwoofer of a ported subwoofer having so low has nothing to do with these speakers. You know the speaker's output is dead by then unless the speaker uh, unless the subwoofer is tuned really high for some reason. You know. Yeah, I've had I've had instances where like with the Paralistons where I try to run those ported full range with my JL audio sealed subs and it was canceling at 20 hertz. Oh, that's and weird. It, because well, because those were ported, the speakers were ported and they were tuned really low, and I just it just did not phase align correctly with the uh, sealed subs. It's just an option. I've seen I've seen instances where. I get better bass integration by keeping everything either ported or everything sealed in the if it's if everything's playing bass. I guess like it would make sense if you have like especially if you're crossing over a low frequency. The only reason I would cross I would use the this speaker in a sealed um function is I guess if you're having that effect that you saw or also if you have a if you want to integrate with these a subwoofer, but you want to you do so at a low crossover frequency. Yeah. Because these, these speakers are fairly low tuned and like you're gonna have some phase rotation around the ports. And so, like that, that might maybe get hard to integrate a subwoofer. So, like if you if you're using some, like a 40 or 50 hertz crossover frequency, that would be a reason to like maybe seal these if you're having trouble integrating with your sub. Well, you got the options, but 95% of installs we recommend keeping both ports open, running these full range, and taking advantage of those awesome bass drivers. Exactly, and and the port too. I mean, you you are taking advantage of the bass drivers without this, but you get just get more low end output. Yeah. And he, here's um. Here's uh, some measurements I did of the vertical axes. Um, the, 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 you'll notice that I, the, it's plus five degrees, plus 10 and plus 15. When, when, I, when I put like a plus or a negative on the vertical axis, the plus means that it's a, those are angles above the tweeter and negative means those are angles below the tweeter. I don't have any negatives on this because this tweeter is mounted relatively low, right? And realistically, no one is gonna be listening on like a low. Below, yeah. You know, lower than the tweeter. Yeah. So, one nice thing is, even though this is an MTM uh, with a horn, there's not a lot of change in the response going from like uh, the on. Yeah, I'm surprised. Point. Usually with MTMs, you start limiting vertical dispersion 15 degrees out, and this doesn't look like it's really doing that. Yeah, this this is, uh, has a very um, even and like almost unchanged response from the on axis response going. It almost looks better 15 degrees off axis. I mean, you would you would if you went higher than this, yeah, you would start to see the woofers canceling each other out, and you'd have a major dip. But like yeah. nobody's probably no one is going to listen in on a higher angle than 15 degrees. Or, so like from from zero degrees to 15 degrees, you're going to have the same kind of sound, like the same sound character from the speaker. So like that's that's good news about these speakers. You don't always get that from a lot of speakers. It might be zero to five degrees. And then after five degrees or 10 degrees, you start losing that that sound. So like th these don't require you to put your head in a vice or to listen to, uh, on a like at the same exact altitude as the tweeter. So that's that's good news about these speakers. That really is, yeah. Here's the the phase um, response. Um, it's a it's a four ohm speaker, and like it's not crazy. It's very consistent four ohms. Well, and it doesn't dip below the IEC minimum, which would be three point two ohms. I mean, it's it's relatively four ohms almost the entire bandwidth up until about two kilohertz. Yeah, it's a it's like there's nothing there's no, there's nothing really harsh. There's no weird. There's no big dips, right? And that's that's what you'd want instead of like having a speaker that maybe has a high impedance but then dips really low somewhere this is a lot more desirable than that to have like just straight up four down to like up to the tweeter where you, you do get some high impedance that's not a problem at all so like it's just it's good news basically but but I mean, since it is for omi you wouldn't want to run this on like a really cheap amplifier or crappy amplifier this is not gonna you know it could probably that can probably even that could still run this but not not very loudly without you know, yeah, man. Problems. If you if you guys are looking to assemble a system with these speakers and you're looking at it in AVR, I would get at least a mid to higher level, you know, Marantz or Denon or Yamaha, and yeah, maybe don't maybe. run this on don't run this on like a five hundred dollar AVR. <laughs> it, it could it could, that could that AVR could probably still run this, but it couldn't run it to its potential. But realistically, nobody's going to buy some three thousand speakers and run it on a five hundred dollar AVR. No, and I, what I would do in that case is I'd buy like a mid grade Denon receiver and preamp out it and get a two or three channel amp and just run the front three sound stage uh, uh, these speakers with like a monolith amp or something like that, you know, because they're so cheap these days to get really high quality power. And yeah, the monoliths are like. Sense. 
three hundred watts, which is really that would make these speakers really. Oh, strange. make them sing for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I mean, with and without the grills. Yeah, this is just kind of a little thing for like, almost like ner speaker nerds who just want to see like this little kind of okay. The blue the blue curve on this graph is with um with with the grill on obviously as it, as it shows and the red is with grill off and like. The, that makes a slight difference. I, I don't I don't know if you can even hear this, but if you go like way above like 10 kilohertz, you start to see some comb filtering from the yep. um, the, the grill causes some comb filtering. And I don't think this would be all that audible. But it like, likely isn't, but it's a, you see that measurement and you're like, oh, okay, I'm taking, I'll keep the grills off. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I mean, if you can run this without the grills, but if you have to have them on, know that this, this measurement, that it wouldn't sound like that, right? Because that, that, the distance and angle of those like comb, the comb filtering spikes you see above like say 15 kilohertz would change. So it wouldn't be audible. It would change from your, from one ear to the other because the distance between your ears are, is greater than the the, the, the the diffraction that's happening. So like it would all like kind of average out and it really, really, wouldn't, really wouldn't be audible. Sure. Well, it looks good. Here we, here's, right, um, so now you measured them separately, each of the drivers and stuff. Yeah, here, I measured them separately. Um, the obviously they're, they're all labeled so you can see that the i guess the points of interest in here is that the you can see how the 2.5 way design works where the upper woofers share the base load of the the lower woofers which just do the deep base yeah. and um uh the, there's the port you can see that's kind of tuned to below like 30 hertz that's a near field recording of the port and um this kind of just shows you for those who are interested this is for speaker nerds you know if you want to yeah. see what exactly what these drivers are doing these are near field measurements i just put the mic really close to the rating and services and it shows you what's happening here there's like you can see that's pretty st steep cross crossovers on the woofers and tweeter that the that that crossover point you know it's just it, it the speaker is functioning normally that's what this is showing you you know it's fine yeah. this is fine yeah so the port output is just for one of those ports. You would have double that output for both, right? That that measurement is for both ports open. Oh, it's... I, and I, I measured this on just one port. Yeah. And so, yeah. but the, the response would be the same if whether I put the speaker, the mic near either port. But if I, I think I have a graph here. I don't know if it's still in this, this presentation, but it shows you what happens on a near field recording of the ports one versus two, and it, that would change the response. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, that's the graph here. Yeah, here it oh. is. Okay, this is really getting the nitty gritty for speaker nerds, you know? So like, if you plug a port, okay, the lower two curves there are, are the impedance response, okay? And this is showing you what happens if you plug a port. Um, yep. You lower the, the nadir of the, 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 the saddle and that um, low frequency impedance response, that's, that shows you how the, the port tuning changes. And, yeah, and, lowers. And here I'm showing you how that corresponds to the, like, the, the peak of the the port response. So this is a near field recording. The upper two curves are like a near field um, recording of the the port, right? And so if you plug a port, um, it, it lowers the tuning frequency to 26 hertz, right? Which is pretty low. And um, yeah. if you don't, well, 37 hertz is still pretty low. You know, that's it's fine. So if you if you I would say if you have a room and you don't want to use a, a small room you don't want to use a subwoofer you would get a lot of room gain you would have really deep bass if you did plug a port you would lose some headroom but you would have ser serious deep bass in a room with lots of like um gain you know low frequency gain so mm -hmm. like th there, there's a case for plugging a port and i guess that's in a, in a small room with like and, and you're not using a subwoofer yeah plug one of those ports you're probably not going to crank these things so loud that you'll take full advantage of both ports anyway so if, it, if there's any users out there that have these speakers, the 1723 Tower S or just the regular one without the S, the bigger drivers, give us some comments in the thread below um, if you sealed one port versus leaving both open. If you're running a two-channel system, you know what did you notice about the difference in the bass output and the depth of the bass? Definitely would love to hear some user feedback on that. If the the full like 1723 non-S towers had actually three ports. So that would be complicated. If I did that in this graph, that'd be pretty complicated. Oh yeah, yeah. But you wouldn't want to plug like both ports open, or both ports on a three three port speaker because you would run into chuffing a lot of really, yeah, raw chuff really fast. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This is the uh, the rundown, the kind of the 
boiling all the, the points. Of the, yeah, we got a lot of stuff here. So pr let me uh, pull us up so we can see us talking here. So nicely balanced tonality, powerful bass down to 35 hertz and potentially lower. If you seal one of those ports and you're in a small room, you get some gain. Good directivity control, terrific build quality, as you said many times. And as you could tell by the, you know, the heft, heft of the box. Attractive styling, outstanding packaging. And I'm still blown away by the free uh, shipping and 60-day trial period. That's just, that's awesome. In this day and age, if you want to try something out, you got two months basically to see if these are the right speakers for you. And if you don't like them, you just send them back. So that's really cool about that. I'll put the links in the description below if you guys want to order. We put some links to Arendel Sound. And um, you guys give us some feedback on how you like these speakers. And it's interesting the comparison you made here. James, you know, he's talking about the Golden Ear, the Kef, the Focal, the SVS Ultra, and the Revel Performer. What about, uh, I guess, the Polk R? I would guess it would be the L600, not the R600, right? Because it's the uh, more expensive version. Yeah, the, the, I guess the L. I mean, the R600, I, I love the R700s. Those are great speakers. R700, I'm sorry, yeah. But the L600s are closer in pricing to these, so it's like probably more properly compared to um, I get. I think what makes the L Legend, the Polk Legend L600s, more comparable to these is like, well, the R600s, they have kind of like, they don't have the greatest like uh, finish on them, right? Yeah. They are. They're not that expensive, but they have to give up something for that for what they do. So they have this like it's like a vinyl finish, right? And it's not the fanciest. Where the, whereas the Legend um, Legends have like a really good finish and like even higher build quality than the the reserve speakers. Yeah. So like they're more properly. That's more like where the Aaron dolls are at, um, in in their in this class of speaker, you know. And like, I, I threw up here that a, f a few like mentions of some competing speakers. I don't really know how they compete. I mean, exactly one for one. But the bottom line is, um, okay. So you, these speakers really give you like a really nice build quality, really nice finish, a, a pretty a nicely linear response, and a lot of dynamic range. Now a lot of the competitors give you like like two of those things, but just nothing, nobody really gives you all three. Like all these, all these competitors don't really have, like some of them have the dynamic range, but they don't have the linearity of these, or they have like a really nice finish or they're just, this, this balances everything so well, in, in my opinion. So I think mm -hmm. this is very competitive. I think um, like, like say like for, for instance, the def definitive technology demand D17 is like really nice speaker, really flat response, excellent build quality. And they probably even have a more linear response on these um, uh, Orin dolls, but they wouldn't have the dynamic range, right? Yeah, definitely not. Yeah. The Focals or the Golden Ear, the Caps especially, would not have the dynamic range of these. These have crazy, the Polks, the Polk Legends probably would not ma match these. Well, for dynamic and range. part of that is the THX Ultra rating. I mean, it's nothing to sneeze at. When you see an, an Ultra rating on a speaker, it means it's going to have some hefty output capability. Yeah. I mean, and, and when, you, when you say dynamic range, like, we're talking across like from like you know 35 hertz to 20 kilohertz right we're, mm -hmm. we're talking across the band where you have to have a lot of output and low distortion these have that there is no you know for the i don't know how it is for full range speakers but for subwoofers one of the requirements i i believe is that you can't surpass five percent harmonic distortion at any drive level even if you turn it all the way up it won't go and so, like, there's probably a similar. I mean, you could probably do that with these since they're past the speakers. Give enough amplification, and yeah, you'll, you'll get some distortion eventually, right? But these are very low distortion, very high, high output speakers, and I, I couldn't, you know, in my own home, I couldn't use them to as loud as they could get, you know. So, like, they just do. They're really great balance of everything for the pricing. So, like, um, they're just a great choice, you know. And and with this free return shipping, and, and a 60 day trial period, if you're shopping for speakers in this price range. Definitely check them out. Definitely give them a try. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's the last slide. Yeah, that's it. So, so this is like the third or fourth product that you reviewed for Arundel, and I think there was a question before. Someone said, "Would you recommend the 1723S Tower over the 1723 monitor with subs?" So, I think I think the subs is what really. Um, answers the question on which one you would probably go with right because if you don't have the subs you definitely want the tower because the tower on its own is sustainable for full range you won't necessarily need to add a subwoofer if you get the tower but if you get the monitors you most likely will want to add a subwoofer especially if you're doing home theater 
Yeah, I would I would get with subs probably the the sub the seventeen twenty three monitor just make more sense than the seventeen twenty three S towers, but like the, and also the uh, the one hundred hertz like low pass filter for those two um, lower woofers might make it a little tricky to integrate subs right because you're gonna have phase rotation at that low pass filter right, and so like you could do it, but you you might want to double check the results if you have like a cheap like kind of like a low budget auto eq system mm -hmm. so like um get the monitors for for subwoofers <laughs> right i mean you could you could still use the, the towers for them and it would be fine but like that the monitors will make it easier to integrate with the subwoofer right. and, and, and you have like more like mid-range output since now you have those two eight inch woofers taking care of that range instead of two 6.5 so you just just yeah, I mean, if you're you just use just get the monitors if you're using the subs, you know, for a heavy heavy duty system. I want to share real quick, just um, so people are aware. If you go to audiohawks.com, you'll see our written review here. It's on our homepage. A couple of pull quotes because people are asking your subjective listening impressions. I pulled some quotes out of your review that I thought really stood out in case people don't want to read because your reviews are long. They're like five or six thousand word reviews, <laughs> eight thousand. Yeah. Reviews. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine, but it's just, it's a beast to edit these. But anyway, the, uh, you talked about the packaging with some of the best you've seen. These speakers look like they should cost a lot more than they do. Um, some subjective listening impressions are down here. Arundel, Arundel has raised expectations of build quality and loudspeakers. I think that's a pretty strong statement on build quality right there. 1723s towers were able to reveal the depth and mastery of both the artistic and technical aspects of this recording the 1723s towers gave these songs a strong low frequency foundation without being without becoming boomy or overbearing so i mean there's you got some nice quotes in here so i do encourage anyone that's a serious shopper to basically go and read this review get as much information as you can james happily provides that here and James is pretty pragmatic, so to put these kind of quotes up means he really liked the speaker, and he does most of our speaker reviews, so that says volumes or the quality. Here's the last one. The dynamic range of the 1723S tower is astonishing for a mid-sized floor-standing speaker. Yeah, so I just wanted to share that with everybody. Go check out the review. It's in the de video description down below. So you've reviewed the 1723 monitor the tower a couple of the subs and i think you are you working on a 1961 or is that something that you're looking at in the future um we were talking about in the future i would like to take a look at this i did a review of the 1723 um 2v which is like a their dual driver vented mm -hmm. giant, giant monster and what we're talking about in the future i might do a review of the single driver 1723s because i did review the 1961 subwoofers both the ported and the vented one i mean the, the ported and the sealed one <laughs> port is just another word for vented so uh yeah so we, we might take a look at the single driver 1723 um subwoofers in the future so that's maybe hopefully later this year that that might come about i'd, I'd like to because like they're just so good right their, their products so far have been so good like i i like dealing with really well-made well-engineered products so like yeah we'll see you know that's if, if we do that that'll be la later this year all right, guys, the company is Arendelle Sound. They're a Norwegian company, and they give you a 60-day trial period, free shipping both ways. Check out our reviews. James, I appreciate you spending the time putting this PowerPoint together, doing the written review, doing those measurements outdoors, lifting that heavy tower up on your platform to give us accurate measurements is always appreciated. Guys, don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me. If you want to suggest video topics or just, you know, ask any questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.